Welcome to Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Now tonight, it's the year of the dog in China as of this week, so will Google be the Chinese government's poodle? Also, an artist on the front line, Steve Mumford, will show us some of his images from the war in Iraq. And what you didn't know about Mexican culture in New York, we'll hear about immigrants in New York with lives in two lands. First to Google in China and the big picture of more economic freedom combined with some say more political repression. My guest is Sharon Hom, executive director of the human rights group known as Human Rights in China. Hi Sharon, thanks very much for coming Hi, on. Thanks for having uh, us. Let's talk about this Google thing first and I want to play a clip right away of one of the co-founders of Google almost two years ago talking about doing business in China. Okay, I guess we don't have that clip yet. We'll get to that co-founder, uh, Sergey Brin, from Google in just a minute, and I think we have it now. Filtering mechanisms for the Internet, and maybe so specific to Google now, but certainly there, is no, there are no trade-offs involved. So are you disappointed that they are now cooperating with China on censorship? Well, I think the more important question is uh, there are trade-offs, and they've clearly made them and uh, uh, not so much. <clears throat> I think that there are a lot of people inside China who are not only disappointed, but will be bearing the brunt of Google taking its enormous resources and uh, stepping on the side of helping to promote the censorship. What exactly did Google agree to? Well, it appears that uh, it's not about an agreement, but um, Google, one of the things that Google offers is a search engine service. That is a search engine so people can search the World Wide Web. And it has Google.com. And the Google.com has both uh, different language interfaces. So you can, uh, previous to uh, acquiring this new domain, Google.cn, which is its uh, search engine with servers based inside China. CN for China. Right. So um, the, the prior to that, Chinese users located inside China, that is behind the firewall and behind this whole system of content filtration and surveillance, uh, would try to search, and they could go to google.com, search through the English or the Chinese language interface, and then would find it increasingly slow, or very slow, because of the censorship and the, um, the content filtration. And, it was, uh, and Google felt that, well, in order to give, perhaps, uh, according to its public statements, to give the user a, more, um, a less frustrating experience of finding a lot of blocked results, that they would s set up this new search engine. Now, this new search engine, what this new search engine does is it, that is Google itself, will block will not give, will censor the search results and will not give the Chinese user search results that are, that are either censored or not approved of by the Based Chinese government. Based on what? A specific list of words or something like that? Well, this is what's unclear, but what is, what is clear is that it's a dynamic list, given that it's not a, a, a monolithic, non-changing <coughs> blacklist, um, so that it would be a list of, uh, and we would know how censorship works, is we'll know what's blocked when you try to find it. Yeah. But clearly we know the universe of what's blocked, and that would be anything so, on democracy. Yeah. So if political, I went to Google.cn yeah. and entered the name of your group, Human Rights in China, right. what would I see? Well, actually, we did that <laughs> when this search surprised. engine when this search engine rolled out. Um, <clears throat> we did a comparative search. We uh, fed in. We used an English and a Chinese language interface. We went to Google.com, both English and Chinese. We went to Google.cn, and we did English and Chinese. And what you find is if you do Google.com English or Chinese, we come out, our website comes out as the number one result or the number two result if you go into Chinese. Um, if you go to the Google.cn, we don't come out at all in the first 100 results, though there was an interesting last week, um, kind of a broken uh, mirror site. That is, there was an attempt at mirroring our site, hmm. but it wasn't complete. Mm -hmm. So there was um, that, um, and uh, that gives you a very different <coughs> universe. Uh, a different World Wide Web. If you look in China.cn, it becomes a much smaller world. Would you rather that Google had just decided to stay out of China than do this? 
I think that that's a false question. Uh, I think that Google and Microsoft and other uh, corporate leaders have posed the question like that. And posing it like that, it's a, a straw dog, because <laughs> uh, it's not really the question. Um, the question is not whether these transnational IT companies should do business in China. The question is how they do business in China. And how they do business in China should be in compliance with and should be promoting each company's both their mission, and for in Google's case, it's norm-based, you know, it's values-based, it's do no evil, and it should be in compliance with um, law. Right. Well, that's a nice standard for you to set, mm -hmm. but the government of China has the final say as to whether they allow them to do business in China. So they either have to ch uh, uh, comply with Chinese government demands or not do business there, no? Well, no, because I don't think it's either or either. The Chinese government clearly is interested in having international companies invest in China. They're very interested in having private capital overseas capital in China, though increasingly it's uh, needing less of our um, foreign direct investment. But they do want the, and why do they want it? It's because China has made a decision to become more part of the international economic order, the economic regime, uh, the global marketplace. And to be part of the global marketplace, you have to welcome foreign companies. So I think it's a, number one, it's a false risk that, you know, if they do something the Chinese government dislikes, they'll be kicked out of China. So that's number one. And number two, how they do business in China, the companies can together, as belatedly Microsoft today, as uh, yesterday and today has been calling for, is that there is an IT industry council, which is quite powerful. It's a powerful lobbying. So that what the companies can do is, if they want a level competitive playing field, they could work within the corporate sector, within the corporate community, and build a <coughs> consensus so they can help raise the standards for human rights rather than everyone play by lowering standards. I don't know if anybody uh, watching wants to call in on this. Maybe you have some thoughts about Google. Anybody who works for Google or Microsoft or Yahoo want to call in on this? Or anybody concerned with human rights in China in general? Uh, with anything in that realm, you can call in for Sharon Hom right now. You should see the number on your screen, 212-251-0801, 212-251-0801. Um, someone suggested to me that the old Sullivan principles mm -hmm. that apply to South Africa, you know, of course, during the apartheid era, there was a big disinvestment right. or divestment right. movement right. from South right. Africa. Right. But then some people sort of know, okay, you can do business in South Africa if you adhere to certain ethical guidelines that right. don't prop up apartheid or somehow seem to right. fight it. Would a model like that be applicable to IT businesses doing business in China? Well, um, it's not a hypothetical question. Uh, in fact, um, I, I think, let me say quickly about the Sullivan Principles. Um, there was a history in the 70s and the 80s when there was this corporate social responsibility movement where the corporate community essentially said, we want to self-regulate. And so they really um, uh, fought and struggled against, you know, government regulation either on the international arena or the domestic arena. So you went to these kind of voluntary <laughs> codes. However, since then, what you have are two important developments. One is that the UN norms on uh, multinational enterprises and other and uh, multinational companies and other enterprises doing business abroad. These are an important set of norms that have garnered broad support among NGOs, among governments, and among the corporate community, though they have expressed some reserves, uh, reservations. So these norms are building on internationally accepted norms of human rights, labor rights, environmental protections. So they're very broad, and most importantly, they tie in to specific uh, guidelines. And, um, and I would say that that's the norm that companies might look to. We had a guest on my radio show who said that China has something like 30,000 internet police. Does that sound right to you? Well, I know that's a number that's widely um, referenced. Um, the and so I think we have no way of confirming the numbers given exactly the nature of security police. What do they do? What, that, what, what does an uh, internet yeah. cop but do? What is more important is that the numbers, uh, whatever the numbers are, whatever the numbers are, they certainly can't have a one-to-one -to, -one to control a hundred over a hundred and eleven million, you know, uh, uh, users online or or the thing. So what's really happening is that the censorship is through law 
through this police apparatus and surveillance, which includes some of these uh, internet police, or they call them the da mamas, the big mamas. Yeah. You know, this is funny. You know, we spend so much time yeah. these days debating Bush administration, yes. internet yes. surveillance yes. in yes. this country, yes. and telephone yes. surveillance. Yes. And you got to figure China has a very sophisticated apparatus at this. Do you think they do? They have a state of the arts, both technologically, and then it's absolutely buttressed by a whole culture of self-censorship, which is a longer uh, topic. But uh, in terms of the state of the arts, uh, what it has, um, this information infrastructure, the internet infrastructure, <coughs> was essentially built and sold the equipment, the hardware, the software, um, the connectivity services. Um, this is all, a lot of it was built by foreign companies. Nortel built the backbone, Cisco provided the routers, uh, and then you have Microsoft on the software. And today you continue to have once WTO accession opened up the market for services, uh, then you have all of these, these services going in now. So what you're telling me is that these companies, Cisco and others, are not only complying with internet surveillance and censorship in China, they're facilitating it. Um, I think that what the uh, they're facilitating in different ways, and I understand that there are very different kinds of challenges. So that what Cisco's claim is that when they sell routers, routers are routers. <laughs> so wherever they sell them, they're saying, you know, we uh, that argument actually doesn't uh, hold water because if uh, if we if we think back a little bit, not too far back, but in Central America and Latin America, when um, foreign companies sold, let's say, Caterpillar, how do you call them? The, the um, tractors? Tractors, yeah. And that, that, that plow up earth and things. Well, if you sell them to the military, they're probably going to be used for digging up mass graves. But a caterpillar, if you have a reasonable know what they're going to be used for, what they're going to be put to use for, I think that they should be held to that standard of knowing what it's going to be used for. It's not a secret. China is widely known to be a one party um, authoritarian state. Um, its history of repression is quite clear. Uh, extending to violent crackdown, as we saw before all of the world media, June 4th, 1989. And what we really see is that the situation in terms of crackdowns and repression has actually <coughs> intensified and worsened. And in some of, if you look at in some areas, has worsened since 1989. And so when companies go into business in China, they should be aware of the investment climate. Now, let me tell our viewers, I think we had a little glitch with our phones. We had a few people holding on, and, and uh, now you're gone. But I think we've cleared that up. So if you want to call back or if you want to call, our lines are open to talk about human rights in China, Google, crackdowns, anything else, 212-251-0801, 251-0801. Call us up for Sharon Hom, executive director of the group Human Rights in China. We talk about crackdowns. I want to ask you about... Um, an incident that reportedly took place in December. I, I want to read to you from the December 10th New York Times, and it says residents of a fishing village near Hong Kong said that as many as 20 people were killed by the paramilitary police this week in an unusually violent clash that marked an escalation in the widespread social protests roiling the Chinese countryside. It was the largest known use of force by security personnel against citizens since the killings around Tiananmen Square in 1989. Um, are you familiar with this incident? Can you confirm it? We can't confirm it. Uh, and as you know, there were media reports, and people who tried to report out uh, were then subject to uh, various kinds of uh, detentions. Uh, and some people who tried to go to the facility, you know, go to the site, was beat up. I, th I think the important point about what happened in Dungzhou is number one, it's part of a, a pattern and a growing trend of massive protests. And these protests are around land uh, grabs, corruption, uh, loss of jobs, the whole social dislocations that are resulting from economic reform. In so fact, all, the, this the, is part of all of that. The context in, yeah. in the time shocked me because I had no idea of, of the scope mm -hmm. of this. Again, I'm going to read from the New York Times and, and ask you to expound on it. Uh, Chinese took to the streets to protest land seizures, corruption, pollution, and unpaid wages, just the kinds of things you were talking about, in record numbers in 2005, the National Police said Thursday. The number of, quote, public order disturbances rose 6.6 percent .6 last year to 87,000. Mm -hmm. 87,000 mm -hmm. social disturbance protests in China in one year? Right. Um, first, I think that um, those numbers are probably underreported. 
Underreported. Underreported. Because if they're going to disclose the numbers, uh, first we have a whole problem of information control in China where um, social protests and the number of social protests, like labor protests, are classified as state secrets. So when the numbers are released, these numbers are vetted. Uh, these have been approved for release. And you can just think back to SARS, HIV AIDS, what happened when those numbers were released? Why would These the Chinese all... government even say 87,000 protests in the last year? It sounds like such a massive number. Yeah. Well, I think in the context of China, with 1.3 billion people, uh, 87,000 is not a terribly large number. And the other, the second part of it is, you know, I wouldn't venture to guess what goes on inside the minds of the Chinese government, <clears throat> but certainly um, the, it's clear that in the international media, reportage of these incidents have been increasing. Um, there's a little bit of a, a confusion because the uh, massive protests are different than another category which was previously reported and that would be mass incidents. So mass incidents are incidents involving more than a hundred <coughs> people and that was also on the rise and that means if they reported 74,000 quote mass incidents that means incidents involving more than a hundred people. Uh, how is the government responding to them? That's important. Like, how is the government responding and? to these rising social protests? I think in a couple of ways. Um, the easy way, which we don't read much about, um, is that they might, if it's out of work, angry uh, workers, or they might pay off some of them, pay off some compensation, and that sort of solves it. But the, but the more um, obvious way is the rising use of violence, um, using both um, the People's Armed Police, the PAP, which uh, is, um, they have publicly announced they're moving the combat effectiveness, raising the combat effectiveness of the PAP. And secondly, that's through that, there's a rising use of, um, and, and I hate the word in English, but like thug violence. Um, these are, uh, paramilitary is inaccurate, but it's clearly um, mm, underground elements, thugs, who are beating up people. On behalf of the state, officially? Well, I think that what it looks like, certainly, is we don't know if, you know, there's no contract that we can see or any orders, but certainly <clears throat> it is condoned by the state. And it serves the state's purposes in, 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 in frightening and scaring people, and et cetera. Let's take a phone call. Roy on the Lower East Side. Hi, you're on the air. Hi, how uh, responsive has the Bush administration been in putting pressure on China to uh, be accountable for these things. Well, I, I don't want to speak for the um, Bush government or the administration, but from where we sit, that is from the NGO human rights perspective, um, I think to look at the administration, the administration speaks with two voices, at least two voices on the human rights situation. One voice is engagement, and that is the human rights, let's engage them behind the scenes, dialogue, low-key talks, um, uh, try to engage. Uh, and part of engagement is uh, the rule of law programs that the, China, uh, that the U.S. government funds. These are capacity building, uh, helping them with legal reform projects. So <coughs> that's uh, that part of it. The other part of the administration speaks with the trade uh, agenda. That is, we want to keep the markets open. We want to open Chinese markets for U.S. business. We want to make it competitive for U.S. business. So you've got the trade agenda and the human rights agenda. And on both of them, uh, depending on different times, the, 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 the administration, I think, is trying to uh, uh, push both. Well, you however, know there's a, there's however, a the, Go ahead. The, the, the human rights agenda in the overall analysis appears to uh, be trumped by trade and economic interests, which and, is and, no big surprise. And I don't have to tell you that there's a theory that says the twain meets in these two agendas. Because if you have economic engagement, if you have uh, increasingly a free market system in China and a globalized free market mm -hmm. system in China, um, inevitably you're going to co come in contact, or China's going to come into contact with more free thought, more free peoples, right. and it's going to gradually open up on its own inevitably as a result of trade. How much of that do you believe? Well, I think it's wishful thinking. Uh, it has not empirically been proven in anywhere in the world that I can think of, and it certainly won't happen in China. It's also known as the Washington Consensus, I suppose. Um, but um, the Chinese expression, you know, if you open the window, a few flies will get in. So that's kind of what you're saying, uh, that it is true that once you open the window, you cannot completely control what gets in. So that is true. However, that is a different point to say that economic reforms 
will lead to democratic reforms or greater protections for human rights. And that's uh, a problem for, 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 let me just point out quickly two main reasons. One is that there was a debate in China in the 80s among the Chinese in, inside the party uh, with respect to economic modernization and political reform. And the party made the decision then that they would bifurcate it. So it, it was delinked. So that while the commitment to economic reforms, uh, it's very clear that the uh, Chinese government policy is not to allow political reform. So this hope that economic reforms will sort of uh, uh, trickle down uh, to political reform is going to be difficult in light of a very stated, clear, effective policy to keep it separate. Um, so I think, I think that's a problem. Uh, the second problem is, is that um, the recent white paper on, uh, that the, the Chinese government released has also conspicuously omitted any references to political reform. So it's not on the agenda. So it's not going to happen by a mysterious osmosis trickle-down process. It's got to happen with a commitment to it. There's got to be a political will. And, and after reading about uh, the protest um, over that power plant, Mm -hmm. And that number, 87,000 protests mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a rising number mm -hmm. by, by over 6% in the last year. You know, I wonder if maybe rather than democracy coming through the work of intellectuals who value dissent mm -hmm. in the abstract, mm -hmm. it's going to come piece by piece around the country from people fighting for local interest, fighting against corruption and pollution and land seizures and things like that. That's absolutely right. And there's a growing movement in Chinese called the Weichuan movement, which um, has been translated variously, but I would say that it should be translated as a, a rights protection movement. It's China's civil rights movement. It's China's civil rights movement. And the people involved in this Weichuan movement are exactly these kinds of grassroots groups. They're lawyers representing these kinds of groups. Um, they do involve some intellectuals. But a lot of these are grassroots groups that are organizing around the corruption, the access to health care, um, the, 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 the labor security, safety issues, the environment, environmental degradation, you know, all of that. So this is a very hopeful sign. But I don't think it's either or. I think the role of the intellectuals are very important. But I do think it's bottom-up happening now in China. And it's how do you see the big picture now? Because usually in the Western press, what we tend to read about is the isolated case of one detainee or another. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What do you see as the overall human rights picture? Is it going in the right direction, in the wrong direction? Is it status quo year after year? Yeah. What? Yeah. First, um, it's not a monolithic picture because China is really uh, quite complex. And if you look at what's happening in Tibet, if you look at what's happening in Xinjiang, if you look at what's happening in the poor rural areas, you know, you, you really have a different assessment. For the people in the urban areas, particularly that you really see featured uh, as the poster child of economic the, the benefits of economic uh, reform, Shanghai, Beijing, Guang, you know, the, the cities, you see a very modern uh, city. And even myself, when I've gone back recently, I'm, I'm really amazed at how the cities change. But if you look at the vast majority of the country, where you have over 700 million rural poor who don't have access to basic health care, you know, you're talking about uh, 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 economic, cultural, and basic economic rights where people don't even have a livelihood. And then their land is being taken away from them, so they're losing the land. Um, I think those are very serious, mass human rights violations. Last thing, and back to the Internet. I have a friend who is from China, lives here, owns homes in both places, and says, you know, they can't really stop Internet traffic in China. They can slow it down. They can mm -hmm. stop mm -hmm. some of the people some of the time. Mm -hmm. But there are just too many ways to hack your way through on the web. Do you agree? Um, I think that the problem is not stopping. Um, the firewall and the blocking is only half of the information control. The other half of the information control is content surveillance. So the danger is not that you don't get through only. The danger is that you get through and they're keeping a record. Mm. And this is what we see in the, in the convictions and the sentencing of dissidents or even activists or Internet activists, that the evidence to convict them is this pile of email that was allowed to get through, but that is the evidence. So it is, it is more serious than not getting through. But I do agree that there's tremendous pressures to not put that many controls on the Internet because it slows it down. And you need information flow for the government. You need information flow for a market to function. You need information flow for the scholars. You need information flow for media. It, it, you can't have a market system without information. Sharon Hom, Executive Director of Human Rights in China. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian.
Coming up next, Mexicans in New York, one of our fastest growing immigrant groups, and an artist on the front line, Steve Mumford, will show us some of his images from the war in Iraq. This is Brian Lehrer Live. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. New York is about stories, about people, about neighborhoods, what things change, what things stay the same. I'm Wayne Svoboda, here in Flushing, Queens, the most ethnically diverse county in the country. I've worked as a journalist or professor in London and Africa, in Prague and Kosovo, in Moscow and Asia and Iowa. New York looks like all these places. It looks like the world. It looks like America. The Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York is a great place to roll up your sleeves and figure out how news happens. CUNY journalism students see the city's people and neighborhoods and changes up close. They listen, they watch, they ask questions and they report back. I tell my friends the best way to find out is to go see. In the core class I teach on the craft of journalism, I send my students to neighborhoods like this one in Flushing. I help them learn how to find things out in this vibrant, powerful, complicated city, and then write a tight, pithy story on what they've seen. The process is a kick. Join us. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Of course, we're a long way from Mexico, and when you think of immigration from Mexico, you probably think of places like Texas and California. But a lot more Mexicans are coming to New York in recent years, and it may surprise you how much they travel back and forth and keep part of their identities in each country. With me now is Baruch College professor Robert Smith, author of a fascinating new book called Mexican New York, Transnational Lives of New Immigrants, published by the University of California Press. Welcome. Thanks a lot for coming in. My pleasure, Give Brian. me the big picture first. How many Mexicans, roughly, are living in New York City now, and how fast is that growing? Um, it's an interesting story. Mexicans now number about 450,000 um, in New York City. And, um, within, and, and within this last six months or within the next six months, Mexicans will pass Dominicans as the group with the largest number of births in New York City. Hmm. Um, the, the trend for Dominicans has been going down and for Mexicans has been going up. So um, in about within 10 years, Mexicans, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans will all be roughly the same size. Your book follows so, immigrants from a place called Tijuana. Is that how Tijuana. you say it? Tijuana. It's, it's, uh, it's a fictitious name. Oh, it's a fictitious name. Yeah. So what is it based on? Uh, it's based on the dance of the Tijuanis, which is a, a, a religious and civic dance that's, that's used in the rituals of this, of this particular town. But are you really fo following people from one particular town? Yeah, it's a real town. It's and not a composite or anything. I just, it's a, it's and you a, don't want to identify the town. How come? Um, <laughs> You've asked me this question before. <laughs> um, it's, it's a confidentiality thing. It wasn't utterly necessary, but it was easier. And I, the thing I had mentioned to you before was uh, freelance journalists floating about and, uh, when I was early in my research, and I, I wanted to, uh, to, to keep the field site. Privacy. Uh, yeah, for you, intellectual property rights, privacy for them, keeping yeah, immigration off their back. This, this or? way I can tell people's story. Um, f people can tell me their stories, and I can tell those stories frankly um, and directly uh, and not have to worry. And so yeah. all the names in the book are fake names, um, but they're all real people and real stories. Is and there a little Tijuana in New York, a neighborhood where a lot of people from this town, whatever it actually is, live? 
Um, you know what? What's interesting is the people from this town, they're concentrated in two or three places, but they're spread out. The Mexicans in New York have a very different settlement pattern than many other ethnic groups and than Mexicans in other cities, right? I mean, if you go to Chicago, you go to the Pilsen District, or if you go to, you know, Los Angeles, well, by this point, you know, most of L.A. is, is quite Mexican. But in New York, the, the pattern has been quite dispersed. Uh, over the last 15 or so years, there have emerged five or six little Mexicos in Sunset Park, um, uh, El Barrio in Manhattan, Jackson Heights, South Bronx. There's even um, places on Staten Island that have, um, that have Mexican concentrations. We're going to show some images from your book in just a minute and some fascinating images, and you'll tell us a li little bit about uh, the people we'll be seeing. But what are the push factors? What pushes people to leave there for here? Um, well, the, it, there's a long-standing, I mean, the, the, in the 80s, uh, people called the 1980s the lost decade in, in, in Mexico's uh, economy. Um, and then the lost decade of the 80s continued into the 90s. And, 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 you know, there are certain places in national economies that don't get developed as much as other places, right? We are the most, uh, you know, we're one of the most advanced economies in the world, but we still have Appalachia. We still have many poor places in the country. And the Mixteca region of Mexico is one such place. Um, and it's composed of uh, part of the state of Puebla, part of Guerrero, part of Oaxaca. They're contiguous parts. Um, and it's a very, it's, a, it's a, an agricultural region that gets no rain and has been exporting people for most of the last 100 years, but quite intensively um, for the last 10 to 15. Um, so one is, you know, the economy. Um, there's a great deal of, of pull, though, as well, and that is that Mexicans have become identified as a, as a preferred labor source in New York. Um, and the amnesty program of the late 1980s really worked um, to accelerate and catalyze this migration. You had uh, Mexicans were the second largest group behind Dominicans in, in terms of the numbers of applicants for amnesty. And what this occasioned in the early 1990s and mid-1990s was a massive family reunification. So before you had people who might come and go um, and, you know, you would have <laughs> gradual settlement. This really fostered much more accelerated settlement in the United States. And as the Border Patrol, uh, as the border became much more tightly guarded, the undocumented people who used to come and go no longer came and went. They would just come and stay. Let's take a look at an image from Robert Smith's book, Mexicans in New York. Tell us what we're uh, looking at here. Okay. So um, this is the um, Antorcha para Padre Jesus. It's the torch run for, uh, uh, for Padre Jesus. Um, they're running from a church in Lower Manhattan to a church in central Brooklyn. Um, and it is what's called a peregrinación, a pilgrimage. Uh, and it, and it, what it does is it, it simultaneously expresses devotion to Padre Jesus, um, who's the patron saint of this town of, uh, that I call Tijuana, and it expresses uh, their uh, devotion to the town of Tijuana itself. So running this is uh, a sacrifice and, and a, a, a compromiso, a promise that people make to the town and to affirm their identity as part of the town and to their devotion to, um, to Padre Jesus as well. And so all the, the people running here are um, immigrants from Mexico. They're U.S. born, second generation kids. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see some of them are quite small. And there's probably about 200, 250 runners there. I like the cute little kid on the left where the sweatshirt yeah. goes back down to his ankles. <laughs> um, and of course, this is a, a, a study, your book, of transnationalism, of people who live here but also have an identity and a life there. Right. And, and one of the things that you wrote that jumped out at me is that transnational life is not an alternative to assimilation, but a context in which both positive and negative assimilation can occur. What does that mean? Well, I mean, what you very often, when people hear that I'm writing about the ways in which people who come to the United States maintain contact with their um, with their community or, or home nation of origin, they immediately think, oh, those people are not assimilating. They don't, they don't want to assimilate. They don't want to learn English. And they begin to think that it's sort of some sort of separatism. Um, and when, in fact, um, the people who are most successful at negotiating this transnational life, right, of the, the coming and going and, and negotiating those two worlds are, in fact, the people who have done the best in the United States very often, not always. But they're almost all, you know, you have to, to be a U.S. citizen or have permanent residency to really be able to participate fully in a leadership 
capacity in, in many of these areas, not in all of them. Um, but it's also people who have, uh, you know, been sometimes been more successful in business or have steady jobs, um, who have assumed a position of leadership in the community. And so the thing that I wanted to sort of combat there was this idea that um, assimilation and full settlement is incommensurate with transnational life, that, that more transnational means less assimilation. It's, it's just not the case. And what did you mean by positive and negative assimilation? Well, what I meant um, by that is that um, there are that it, it's this is not there's a, a tendency when you look at academics studying um, immigration and transnational life in particular there's a tendency to sort of celebrate the liberatory aspects of this right that these are people who are re they're not assimilating and not having their culture sort of leached out of them and, and this is true um, and there's also a tendency very often uh, among academics to look at how migrants have created networks to support their migration but there's also negative sides to this and that's what I meant by this and so I wanted to look at some of the difficulties that for example youth face when they come here and to uh, look at how those things also get transnationalized. Let's take a uh, look at another slide, another photo from the book. This is? This is, um, the, uh, this is one of my informants uh, and her son, and they are participating in the dance of the Tikwanis. He is one of the Tikwanis. Um, Tikwani is, uh, and with these are, there's two versions of this. One is that they're the, it, it represents the peasants going out to, to kill a jaguar that has been killing their animals. In the local context of the community that I study, there's an alternative interpretation which goes back to the Spanish conquest, which is that the local indigenous people from the town are um, making fun of the Spanish dandies who have <laughs> settled there uh, by wearing uh, torn clothes and pretending that they're very fancy and, and sort of whooping it up and, and making fun of them. And in this context, then, the, uh, the, 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 the loba, the, or the, the um, tiger, um, becomes a, um, protects the, uh, the villagers instead of being something going after their animals. I wonder if we happen to have any Mexicans living in two worlds watching tonight. If so, call us up or anyone else at 212-251-0801. You should see the number on your screen, 212-251-0801, with any questions or comments for Robert Smith. Um, we saw the woman in that picture, and partly this is a gender study. And one of the things that you wrote about was the tension between the autonomous New York woman and the ranchera from rural Mexico who is utterly dependent on men. How does that tension play out in the lives of some of these women and men who live sort of in both places? Um, one of the things I wanted to do in the book, there's, there's a, a tendency um, in, um, you know, in, among scholars of immigration and, and in popular imagination to think that uh, people migrate from Mexico or another place and they've got these old-fashioned you know, macho ways of, of, of doing gender, of relating men and women in Mexico. And then when women come here, they're liberated and everything is, um, everything is equal, right? It's sort of like the old, bad, traditional place versus the new, good, enlightened place. And certainly women have more opportunities in many ways in New York um, than they had in Mexico. But there's also simultaneously lots of changes happening in the, the negotiation of gender back in, in Mexico. And there are lots of parts of American culture which, in fact, restrict women. Um, so within that context, what I tried to do in the book was focus on ways in which, for example, second generation women tried to take, to keep in touch with Mexican culture um, and to, to reclaim elements of that, second generation meaning women born in the United States, and at the same time also to live out this very autonomous um, life. Uh, one example is um, I follow a particular couple who, um, who are boyfriend and girlfriend, novios, um, and when they go back for these periodic visits, the boyfriend attempts to, um, he renegotiates what I call the gender bargain there, right? He, he, um, he, while she lives quite autonomously in New York, he tries to control her, um, how, how much she goes out into public space. You know, he doesn't want her to drink. Um, he tries to control where his sisters go. He doesn't want his sisters to go out and go to parties late at night because it doesn't look right. And he doesn't try to assert that authority over them in New York. Um, and his father doesn't try to assert that authority over them in Tijuana, but he feels emboldened to push uh, a, a, a more macho gender bargain on
on the women in his life because he feels that it's more local. He'll be more locally supported. With How that. do they resolve things like that? Well, um, the um, the sisters ended up <laughs> basically rejecting his 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 overtures, and, and he got very uh, very angry, right? Because he, they were basically saying, you know, no, I'm not going to uh, go home when you tell me to go home, and if you don't like it, you know, that that's your problem. Um, and but it, it, but it, it was it, the the basis of this. Then it, it's not completely. Um, he didn't. He wasn't without basis to think this way because he the, he felt that he would be held responsible as the older brother if something happened, um, and 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 he may well have been. So it's a, to be fair that there's a there's there's two sides to this story. Let's take a phone call. Carol and Chelsea, you're on the air. Yes, hello, hello, Carol. Hello, Brian. I Hi. listen to your radio sh show too. I'm a regular listener. Thanks. I'm so glad. But um, shall I ask my question? Yes, that's why you're here. Okay. My question is this. Um, do it, do Mexicans like to live and be in their own little enclaves as opposed to mix with other Latinos? My the my reason for asking it is our super and most of the workers in my very large apartment building are Latinos and our super said to me, you know, there's no Spanish church around here. I said, Oh, but yes there is and I said where it was located. He said well, that's a Mexican church. Right. Okay, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, is It goes to one that we've heard many times in a way, which is, is there a kind of transnational uh, Latino identity developing in New York, or is it Mexicans and Dominicans and Puerto Ricans, etc.? That is there a pan-Latino identity, yes. I might say? Um, I think there's both. Um, I mean, you know, in the first instance, how people organize, and you know, this woman's uh, the, the comment that she repeats. So that's a Mexican church. I'm, so I'm imagining that the, the the super she was talking to was not Mexican, and, and felt as if he wouldn't he wouldn't feel comfortable there. There, you know, it's, it's, this is an old story, right? I mean, there were Irish churches, Italian churches, um, and there are now Mexican churches. Um, but there is emerging. And I have watched this, right? One of the the virtues of, uh, of of being engaged in your field work for I mean this is 18, 19 years now, um, is that you, you, you can see trends over time. I have noticed over the last several years that um, there are, is increasingly, like in this, the, the, um, the torch run that we saw the picture of before, when they get to the church, among the things that they say, que viva, one of them will be los Latinos, that, you know, the, you know, long live the Latinos. They'll also say, long live the NYPD, because the NYPD supervises, you know, you know escorts them. Uh, but so the Mexicans ha are developing Mexican, um, you know, New York-based institutions, but there are also the beginnings of some pan-Latino connections. It, and it's not just, I mean, there, there have been good relations with other, um, you know, and conflictive relations with other Latino groups, um, but it's not as if it's one or the other. And, of course, it's, it's not a new story. I mean, you can go back to the early 20th century, and there were, you know, Eastern European Jewish synagogues, mm -hmm. German Jewish synagogues, and quite a lot of uh, right. tension between them sometimes, Italian Catholic, Irish Catholic mm -hmm. churches, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Let's take another look, uh, a look at another image from the okay. book. And what is that? Okay, that is um, is la loba or the uh, tigre, right? And it's from a Nahuatl word, which which was an indigenous language in the town or in the region. It, it still is, and it, but it was used as a primary language um, a generation or two ago, quite widely. In some places, it still is. And this is the, um, the this links with the story I was telling you before. This is either on the first version, the jaguar that goes out and kills the livestock, and the peasants have to go. Um, chase it and, and kill it, or it is the um, it's the the loba who helps chase the the Spaniards away and helps make a fool of the Spaniards. What have you learned about New York as a whole by studying this one immigrant group intensively for fifteen years? Um, one of the things I've learned, um, well, I, I've learned what a, one of the things is going to sound sort of cliched um, is New York is a pretty great place. 
Um, it, 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 it provides opportunities for people, and it really allows people to, I mean, you know, you go and you go to some of these meetings, you f I feel quite at home now. I feel like I'm really part of this community. And I, I have seen over the course of the years that um, many of these uh, second-generation kids have really lived out the dreams that they came here, uh, that their parents had come here for. And, and that's very affirming. That's very positive. I've also learned that... Um, New York is in many ways a, a more complex and interesting place. I mean, the, often, you know, when you go to graduate school or, you know, in the popular imagination, for example, racial conflicts are always black and white. We think in that, and, and black and white and brown. But in fact, um, the racial dynamics that I've studied in this, um, in this community, are the, the tensions are often between Mexicans and Puerto Ricans, right? So, um, and it's not a thing that fits automatically into the, the dynamic, you know, the, or the, you know, the, it's not the way we think about it normally, but it's, it's quite logical given settlement patterns and competition for resources and things like that. Robin Smith, thanks a lot for coming in. Great book. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Brian. Well, coming up next, an artist on the front lines, Steve Mumford, will show us some of his images from the war in Iraq. This is Brian Lehrer Live. comes to continuing education, all stops lead to CUNY. More than 200,000 New Yorkers of all ages in all five boroughs are enrolled in CUNY adult education courses. If you're looking for new job skills to enhance your career, start a new career, or if you want to enjoy a class in the arts, sciences, and humanities, then get on the train and come to one of CUNY's 19 campuses. CUNY continuing and professional education programs offer you more opportunities than any other learning institution in New York City. CUNY gives you high quality instruction at low cost with schedules to meet your busy lifestyle. For more information, call 1-866-344-CUNY or log on to www.cuny.edu slash continuing ed. Hurry up. Don't miss your stop. Come to CUNY. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live on Wednesday nights at 730 you know you find soldiers in war zones, you know you find journalists, but artists with me now to show us some of his paintings from Iraq is combat artist Steve Mumford. His new book is called Baghdad Journal, an artist in occupied Iraq, published by Drawn and Quarterly. Great publisher's name. <laughs> and welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. Pleasure well, to be here. Well, you're not a soldier, you're not a journalist. Why did you go to Iraq? Yeah, well, I mean, I, actually, I call myself an artist, not a combat artist, although I, I wasn't a combat artist while I was in Iraq, because that was a, a term that, for one thing, the soldiers all understood. Um, war as a topic interests me, and I've been doing a series of realist paintings um, about aspects of, of contemporary life before this war started. And, in fact, I just started a series on the Vietnam War, which I'm old enough to remember as a child, my mom taking me to protest marches in Cambridge. Mm. Um, and so when this war started, I suddenly thought, you know, I could actually go. Um, the other Do you see what, what you do as a form of reporting? Yes, definitely. I mean, I see it as being somewhere in between pure art and reporting. Um, it's a role that art has often played in the past, but it's been really de-emphasized, you know, I'd say for the last 50 years. In, in a way, I think the ascendancy of modernism as a sort of culture of art kind of put that, as, you know, on, on the back burner. And at the same time, photography kind of took over that role. Let's t take a look at some of your images. Let's put the first one up on the screen now and just tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, this was done, uh, it was a, a patrol in a, a neighborhood, uh, Zafarania, a neighborhood of Baghdad, which was a predominantly um, Shia neighborhood. This was in October of 2004. And um, the neighborhood was generally peaceful, but there was a... Uh, 
um, an imam who was preaching locally, uh, encouraging violence against the against the Americans and against people that were cooperating with the Americans. So that morning, the task force, which was from the Washington State National Guard, had arrested that imam, and they were also going around and rounding up other people that were sort of implicated in what he was doing. Um, this is a it's a fairly typical scene. Um, I can't it's. I can't remember whether he was actually there. I was so busy just drawing uh, what was going on outside. The whole family had been kind of hustled out. Um, the women would sort of occasionally break out into a wail, and so, which sometimes in these situations struck me as a little practiced, you know. Um, but uh, their emotions that they didn't want the American soldiers in their house were certainly sincere enough. I understand that the only press credential you had was from something called artsnet.com. Mm. Uh, were you able to use that to get to the front, to get to places where battles were taking place? Is absolutely. that how you tried to use it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the first trip I made was right after the invasion, and you didn't really need much in the way of credentials. But as the insurgency got started, the Army really did check you out. Um, sometimes I'd walk into a public affairs officer's room, and uh, he'd say, so who are you from, Time, CNN? And I'd say, no, artnet.com. And there'd be this silence. <laughs> and then suddenly one of the officers would say, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Artnet.com, yeah. New York Times, what's the, difference? <laughs> what's the difference? Let's take another look or look at another image. And here's something you might not expect to see in Iraq. Yeah, golf. well, <laughs> right, golf. The soldiers obviously do anything they can to sort of relieve the boredom. And this was in Tikrit, where there was a huge complex of Saddam's palaces overlooking the Tigris. So uh, one of them, they'd improvised. Uh, it wasn't so much a golf course. It was really just knocking them into the Tigris. And uh, it was just at sunset. It was actually quite beautiful around there. Um, it's not exactly Chelsea Piers. Not exactly Chelsea Piers, but um, it wasn't bad. There was a big basketball court on the inside of that palace, and unfortunately the reporter's pool was right next to that, so there wasn't a whole lot of sleeping going on. How do you distinguish yourself as a painter in a war zone compared to a photographer? Is there something that your drawings and paintings capture that photography can't? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that art is by nature subjective in a way that photography can't be. Um, I mean, obviously, from one sort of very good photographer to, an, uh, to another, you're going to see a difference. The personality will come through. But it's much more exaggerated with drawing because it's, it's the way that we see as individuals that's different for every person. And, you know, an example that I sometimes like to use is in a court case, eyewitness testimony is one of the least reliable sources of factual information because the way we organize how events actually took place is different for each of us. Now, a camera just sort of automatically records what it's mechanically capable of. But when I'm drawing, I'm making decisions the whole time about what to put in. So it's more about out. you. It's, well, let's just say I think it's maybe 50-50 for me. Now, that, that equation probably varies from one artist to another. Um, but that, all that, that editing that goes into a picture and what you subconsciously put in or leave out completely affects the mood of that picture. Let's take a look at another image. What's that? This is the inside of, of what's called a paladin, which is sort of this enormous uh, artillery um, howitzer on tracks. So it looks kind of like a tank, and it has this interior space. Uh, in the drawing, I've made it look a little bit larger than it is. It's a little cartoon-like, too. Um, yeah, well, you know, I've always loved comic books, and, and honestly, I think there's a lot of comic book kind of style in, in, in a lot of my work. Um, but this was uh, in Bakuba, and it was a night when the particular base had just taken something like 15 mortar rounds had been launched at it in a row. So they actually got permission to fire back, which was relatively rare. Did they care that you were staring at them with a pencil and a sketch pad in hand? Well, in this case, um, everything happened so fast. I have composed that drawing from photographs because I wasn't able to. There was barely room for me to squeeze in there with my camera. Generally, I would draw directly from people, but that was an exception. Um, no, it, I, I think that the Army, the, the soldiers liked it, generally, that I was drawing, because they sort of felt like they most, for the most part, felt they were doing a good job, and they wanted people there to record it. And I think that, in a way, they took it for granted that an artist is there to communicate something important, and what they were doing was important. So both they and the Iraqis kind of never raised any objections or even seemed surprised that I was there. I think the next image is a photograph of you drawing. Yeah. There it is. So is this representative of the way you worked? Yeah, 
absolutely. It's, uh, I, I, my paper got a little bit larger on subsequent trips, but um, basically I just find any kind of quiet corner I could. I, I had to work fast because things happened fast. These were um, huge missiles of Saddam's that they were um, attaching plastic explosives to. So after that was done, we all uh, hightailed it out of there, and they, they blew them up. And are you, uh, were you afraid sitting there without any armor or anything while all those troops are so protected? Well, that was an exception. When I was with the American soldiers, I usually kept my armor on, um, on, on missions, that is. And so I had the same stuff that they had in terms of a flak jacket and a helmet. I imagine the Bob Woodruff story this week must have very much hit home to you. Yeah, yeah, that was really horrible. I mean, um, you know, if you're on patrol in Baghdad or anywhere in Anbar province, you know, you, you think about that a lot. And, um, and I was on several patrols that got hit with IEDs or narrowly missed getting hit with IEDs. One patrol was in Ramadi where the IED hit the Humvee right in front of mine, and it turned out it was the only Humvee that the company had that was up-armored. In other words, it had enough armor to actually withstand the, the, the Humvee I was riding in had a couple of metal plates that a Baghdad blacksmith had made for the door and no oh, windows. Wow. So, you know, I, I counted myself as very, very lucky. And Jill Carroll, the journalist for the Christian Science Monitor. Well, that, I think, especially strikes terror into the hearts of, of civilians that are there. She I, was kidnapped. Did you have any close calls like that? Um, no, no, thank God I didn't. Um, the only thing that ever happened that really gave me pause was in October, or no, it was in June of 2004, I was taking a ride out to Bakuba, which was about an hour and a half northeast of Baghdad. And I arranged at the hotel I was staying at, which was a cheap hotel, um, for a driver. And the next morning, I was crossing the street, and a complete stranger came up to me and said, Mr., are you going to Bakuba tomorrow morning? Huh. And I said, no, no, not me. I think that's somebody else that's going to Bakuba. Scary. But I felt like, you know, my god, who Spooky. else knows that I'm actually going? Yeah. Let's take and, a look at another image. and. You know, you said you were you were free from the kind of obligation to rush to the scene of a battle, right. a breaking news event like news reporters over there. Do you think the scenes you captured like this were overlooked by the print media? Well, I mean, the thing about a scene like this is it became very common, you know, in, in the occupation, and it is. It's and give us a, some context for this one. Well, this is a sort of a bread and butter arrest of two suspects, and I was on patrol with the first um, armored cav in Baghdad. Um, we'd been kind of jaunting, going around uh, sort of a jaunty way, hadn't been any problems, and suddenly we got this call of two suspects in, in this car. And the car was quickly rounded up by, um, you can see the Bradley armored vehicle in the background. And um, the snipers had spotted this car, it simply matched the description. So these guys were arrested. While they were sitting there, um, I was making the drawing. And that was an, always an interesting challenge because, you know, it's 130 degrees, Baghdad in the, in the summertime. And, trying to draw with all this flak vest and, and equipment wasn't always easy. Um, they were there for maybe 20 yeah. minutes, so I had to draw really fast. Yeah. I gather that you've said that you were against the war when you went, and that your feelings changed to some degree by being over there. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, I, I marched in the protest march against the war um, here in New York City before it started. Um, and the reason I marched is I felt there was no connection between the war in Iraq and 9-11, you know, which I was also here for. Um, the thing that complicated the whole equation for me was arriving in Baghdad and making friends with Iraqi artists and finding that the younger Iraqi artists, 20-somethings, were generally very much in support of the Americans. And they felt that sort of the American and especially the European left had kind of let them down. Um, by getting Saddam, seeing, seeing the whole situation in the context of Saddam being bullied by the Americans. And of course, they'd grown up in this sort of Stalinist totalitarian state. So my reason for, for feeling much more conflicted about the war was that I felt that maybe we really could do something special here. It's a very chilling and very unique book. Thank you very much for sharing it with sure. us, <laughs> talking about some of your images. My pleasure. And that's it for this week's show. Next week, New York Times columnist Paul Krugman on Democrats, Republicans, and our health care system. Meanwhile, you can listen to my radio show weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC, New York Public Radio. Tomorrow morning, New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd. That's 10 o'clock on AM 820 and 93.9 WNYC tomorrow. Have a great night.